Okay, welcome to the day after the 9-11 anniversary, and uh, I kept checking the TV set yesterday, and I was nauseated by the milk toast coverage of 9-11. I mean, the, the most involved that they would do is they'd kind of mindlessly repeat the mantra of the, you know, the airplanes hit things and everything fell down and the Muslims attacked us, and we need to remember the dead people. 3,000 dead people. No, there were millions of dead people from 9-11. Not just 3,000. Don't be so egocentric. You know, oh, those 3,000 people are worth so much more than all those brown people we killed, and we're going to kill so many more of them until we're satisfied. And when we get satisfied, they'll pull another 9-11 on us so that they'll have something else to justify the carnage. And the, primarily the expense which we bear and they wallow in. And I, I do mean the military industrial complex, military industrial international banker complex. I just get sick of, of the, you know, the, the fact that people won't stand up and talk about things. Do you find yourself self-censoring? Well, we certainly see that everywhere we go. Now, I've been talking about 9-11 being an inside job on TV every week for nine years years eight years okay so I can't count but I'll tell you I mean I haven't had any bad interactions because of it in fact I've had three or four interactions with various police agencies over it and they were giving me thumbs up so you know the police are a lot more hip about that and other subjects than the average public and you know if, when I start getting into arguments with people, I, I can't un understand where they get their conception of what's going on. And you'd be much, much better off to end the argument and say, hey, I think Dancing with the Stars is on right now. Hurry, you know, and let them get out of there. Well, OK, you can't be against the official story unless you know what it is. And here's the good old standby from James Corbett, the 9-11 conspiracy theory in less than five minutes. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the Budget Analyst Office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because 
Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of the incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. All right. Well, then I'm really strong. Okay, so... Uh, getting a little more serious, um, there are serious, serious people doing serious work about 9-11. And the only reason 9-11 is not public knowledge is it is not based on merit. In other words, they're not examining the evidence and saying it doesn't stand up. They're saying we won't examine the evidence because we dare not. Well, here's uh, a short clip about the entire state of 9-11 truth movement and other information right now. And this is with Eric Lawyer, who founded Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, and De or, uh, Richard, um, uh, <laughs> Richard Gage, of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, and this will be about 18 minutes. Check it out. If we're in a free country, why are we afraid to just talk about an event that was the most traumatic event in our history? I originally believed the official story, I aggressively defended it. When I first started cracking open that little window that there could be possibly more to this story, I went through every emotion, just like probably a lot of you here who didn't originally believe it or consider it are going through, and I didn't want to believe it. I came up with every excuse not to believe it. Any building that succumbs to fire, that collapses, starts usually with large, gradual deformations, and the building will begin to fall over, not straight down through the path of what was the greatest resistance. These buildings exploded. that hear sounds of explosions. We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Little, molten um, steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Yeah, like lava. Like, 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 like lava. A volcano. 
This is all direct evidence of explosive controlled demolition. Well, that was a trailer for a new movie premiering September 11th, 2015. Firefighters, architects, and engineers expose 9-11 myths. Now, please welcome San Francisco Bay Area architect Richard Gage, AIA. He is a member of the American Institute of Architects, and he is the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. So, Richard, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you on. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about World Trade Center 7, and obviously it's, it's so important to the whole 9-11 story. Now, the official story, it was just normal office fires that took this building down. Obviously, there's no precedent uh, before or after for something like this happening. Um, talk to me a little bit about maybe the behavior of the building and why it seems like that would be important to the 9-11 Commission to look into World Trade Center 7, yet they didn't. Exactly. The 2,000 architects and engineers that I represent are extremely disturbed because Building 7, the third skyscraper to collapse on 9-11, looks exactly like a controlled demolition, behaves like a controlled demolition, uh, and yet NIST claims eight years later in their official report that this building was brought down by normal office fires. Nobody's buying that. There's witnesses that hear explosions before the building comes down. In fact, the BBC even announced the collapse of this building 20 minutes before it ever happened. So this is absolutely extraordinary. We know we've been not told the truth by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and this is the red flag. Uh, this is the smoking gun of 9-11 that's caused so many architects and engineers to then turn their eye and look at the evidence for the explosive demolition of the Twin Towers, which we find abundant. Right, and, and just from an eyewitness watching it, it came down in the exact same fashion as the Twin Towers, which, I mean, even that was just really bizarre to, to see a building topple from, you know, pancake from the top down like that. And then World Trade Center 7 falls in the exact same way. So, you know, you've spoken about this a lot. There's plenty of stuff online if people really want to get into it. Um, but, you know, what, what's some new evidence, some new things that you're learning? Uh, obviously, I know you're working with a lot of firefighters now as well, first responders. So what are, what are some new things that you're, some breakthroughs you're kind of working with? Indeed, Eric Lawyer, the founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, uh, now numbering 200 firefighters calling for a new investigation. Uh, he cites in this new film, which we're premiering here in New York um, uh, tomorrow night, uh, he cites uh, the, 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 the destruction of evidence, the illegal destruction of evidence in a crime scene. He cites the spoilation of evidence, uh, which are guidelines uh, from the National Fire Protection Association that he goes through one by one, where you're supposed to look for and test for explosives and incendiaries when you have the hallmarks of them. And we do uh, everywhere. There's uh, hundreds of witnesses of explosions, but not one of them appear in official reports. So this is what caught Eric's attention, too, because they say if you have high temperatures like that fire can't even produce, like twice those temperatures, molten steel, molten iron, which is what we have abundantly of, documented by first responders, structural engineers, et cetera, in the, in the piles under the World Trade Center towers, uh, this is all uh, a re requires th them, NIST, to look for evidence of explosives. They say they uh, didn't find any. Later, they acknowledge in writing that they never looked for it. So we'll be talking about the, what was found by an international team of scientists led by Niels Harrett uh, with small red-gray chips of very high-tech nanothermite in all the dust samples that they independently collected. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought that that was really bizarre, you know, many, many years ago when I heard that they were hauling everything away so quickly and shipping it off to China and that that was supposed to be completely normal and they were doing it because it was just such a source site and they wanted everyone to move on and to, to start the healing process. And yet here we have one of the most tragic thing that's ever happened in, here in America and they're hauling away anything to see what could have possibly happened that day. Now I know that you are, uh, you've erected a billboard there right outside uh, the New York Times basically demanding some answers. Um, they were part of the establishment media that was complicit in obeying George W to not tolerate any, you know, conspiracy theories when really that's what you do as an investigative journalist. You look at the facts and you say, this isn't all adding up. So, you know, years later now, we can talk to the establishment media and, you know, what, what are you kind of charging them with? 
Well, we're charging them with the complete censorship of the story of the crime of the century. It is not being played uh, on mainstream media whatsoever. Thank God for Infowars and other uh, excellent outlets who are putting forth the evidence uh, that uh, David Sanger, chief Washington correspondent of the New York Times, claims is not there. That's why this 30-foot-tall billboard is put right in front of their office. And we're going to be out there with a press conference uh, in front of his office uh, laying all this evidence out and demanding that the New York Times take, take accountability and, and, uh, and cover this story. After all, 9-11 uh, spawned two major wars in which over a million people have perished, uh, which is why, by the way, we're reading uh, all of the names of those of those folks, not we, but an independently hosted uh, candlelight vigil, which is very important to acknowledge everything that's happened since uh, 9-11 right. uh, here in New York, the, the people that have, have laid down their lives. Um, we, also, uh, we also are demanding uh, an investigation of the investigators themselves, uh, NIST, uh, not just the media. We actually need an investigation of our, our actual rec elected representatives whom we have given the petition to and our DVD and our other reports uh, when we had 1,000 architects and 2,000 architects and engineers calling for a new investigation. We just keep on going every year. We get millions more people involved, like we were able to reach on C-SPAN, fortunately, 3 million people, and which in a video which has become Washington Journal's uh, number one seen video on that program, C-SPAN. So we are making some headway, Leanne. Absolutely. And the whole motto after 9-11 was never forget. And we will never forget. And we will not let them forget that there is plenty of footage out there, thanks to the internet, thanks to people who are tirelessly chipping away at this. We will never forget 9-11. And we're not going to allow them to shove the official story down our throats so that it just becomes some sort of a meme. Now, very quickly, I think we've got about a minute left. Um, your new movie is going to be premiering uh, September 11th of this year. Firefighters, architects, and engineers expose 9-11 myths. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we're going to take the myths one by one. We go through a dozen of them. Eric Lawyer and myself together on the stage. Um, we, we highlight, uh, you know, was there, was there only two towers? No. We talk about the third tower that we just mentioned. Um, did, was there raging fires in that third building? No. Uh, is there, was there uh, the uh, correct handling of the evidence? No. Uh, we go through it all in the Twin Towers. Was there, did, has there ever been a fire that's brought down a skyscraper? No. <laughs> it's just not happened. So we go through it all. It's, it's a great method to show the American people and your listeners uh, who can who can get this DVD, by the way, on our website, which is ae911truth.org, along with a lot of other evidence that's being used by the 9-11 Truth Movement because the architects and engineers have the technical credibility mm. that it has been necessary uh, to get the word out to people. They, they tend to get it right away when they hear it uh, from building and technical professionals. Well, thank you so much, Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We sincerely appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Leanne. That's it for the show tonight. Thank yeah. you for joining. Okay. Well, that was that for their show. They, they recorded that, actually, I think on the 10th or something. Um, but Richard Gage was nice enough to come on this show a couple of times. Um, well, at least... <laughs> once live, and uh, I recorded him several times at live events, but um, I found him really willing to do whatever was necessary to help get the production going. And, um, you know, it's funny, I feel comfortable being in the, the realm of architects and engineers who think logically and when something is presented that contradicts what they have they consider it and they go by golly you're right or well what about this and then they oh okay and they but they come to an answer it's not something just left there and I I prefer that to the 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 disinfo the counter the COINTEL pro that's being perpetrated upon us um, it's it's amazing, especially people that support the like the 
absolute ridiculous nonsense, the mathematically impossible idea of the directed energy weapon that brought down all three towers. Um, there's several reasons, but you know, just the energy calculation shows that there's you'd have to have more than the combined output of every power generator in the world at once in the period of a few seconds to this device to to do it. And the only other way is to distribute explosives and set them off. And uh, that's what happened, not the directed energy. But how did people get the idea? You know, and why do they believe it? Well. I'm going to try for another copyright violation on YouTube here. Uh, this is for educational purposes. I'm not trying to get glory by playing John Oliver's clip from HBO. But this is really an exceptional example of how lying about history works. And they do it all the time. They lie to you all the time. They disguise news shows. I mean, they disguise the propaganda as breaking news or something like that. And we, you know, we're used to the old days of 60 Minutes or something when they actually did go out and expose corruption. That doesn't happen anymore. And the pseudo exposés that we see, we believe anyway. So we'll go ahead and play this John Oliver clip. It's only a few minutes. We'll be right back. Hello there. I am John Oliver, host of that show you've heard some things about but haven't gotten around to watching yet. <laughs> You think it's called Last Night This Week, or maybe Yesterday Right Now. Don't worry, you'll Google it later. Now, a few weeks ago on this show, you may remember this happened. Presidential clemency has always been controversial, from uh, George W. Bush commuting Scooter Libby's sentence, uh, to Bill Clinton pardoning financier Mark Rich, to, and this is true, Abraham Lincoln pardoning a man convicted of attempted bestiality because the man was intoxicated at the time. The man in question, John Wilkes Booth. It's true. It's actually not true, but if it had been, that would have been amazing, right? It would have been, am it would have been amazing. And you can read more stuff like that in my book, Stranger Than Truth, John Oliver's 101 Favourite History Lies. There is absolutely nothing more fun than lying confidently about history. Lying is incredibly fun. In fact, the only thing that feels better than lying to someone is lying to someone, then regaining their trust, and then lying to them again. <laughs> Studies have shown it produces the same effect in the human brain that cocaine does. Actually, there was no such study, but <laughs> it felt great saying that out loud, so it just seems like a fact. So we are actually producing that book. Next spring, it will be released as a hardcover volume by Simon & Schuster, who I chose to work with, given their wealth of experience printing the factual-sounding bullshit of Mr. Dr. Oz. So, <laughs> you knew they could do it well. Now, in my book, you will find plenty of plausible but unverifiable nonsense, such as the fact that, due to a severe horse allergy, Paul Revere spent most of his famous midnight ride sneezing and vomiting into the streets. <laughs> it's a fact. Uh, you'll also see the fact that Irish step dancing was invented by the farmers of Cork County who used to kill pesky field mice by strapping slabs of wood to their feet and rhythmically clobbering them to death. <laughs> Which, yeah, it really makes you see river dance in a whole new way. You'll also learn that in order to prepare himself for important telephone calls, Winston Churchill would gather his highest ranking officials to watch him tear telephone books in half. <laughs> And uh, while we're on the subject of European leaders, we'll confirm that Catherine the Great did die while having sex with a horse, but what many people don't know is she was pegging the horse at the time. <laughs> she was pegging that horse at the time. <laughs> and one last fact. Just forget about it. Forget about it! <laughs> one last fact. Just wipe it away. One last fact. Did you know that in 1980, Saddam Hussein received a key to the city of Detroit? That is not in the book, because, remarkably, that is actually true. <laughs> I know that you don't trust me anymore, but trust me, it is true. So I hope you enjoyed just a few of my favourite history lies. For the complete list, purchase my book uh, when it comes out in April 2016, except there is actually no book that was another lie. <laughs> this entire video has been a total waste of everyone's time. Uh, if you want to waste some more time, please join us again September the 13th. <laughs> when Last Week Tonight returns. Until then, trust nobody, especially me. <laughs> trust no one. Okay, now, it wasn't really a total waste of time, because now you can understand 
you know, how you get jerked around. I believe it. I don't believe it. I believe it. I don't believe it. Yes. Ah, ah, ah. But no, mo most of these people never get into the I don't believe it phase. And that's where the critical thinking idea comes in. And, you know, there's so much information about 9-11, whether it's true or false, you know, it's out there. And a newcomer, like people who were born in the last 20 years or, or something like that, and maybe even people who were born in the last 70 years, um, really, you know, they get lost when they first enter it, and it scares them. I understand why. Well, a, a little over a year ago, David Chandler came to Portland Community Media, and we made a video called David Chandler, 9-11, The Hard Evidence, and he talks about just three irrefutable scientific facts that demand, each one by themselves, but not even taking all together as three, but each one by, the, by itself would demand a brand new investigation or at least obey our own laws, obey our own rules about investigating, obey our own rules about evidence. <laughs> The, uh, I guess if you could characterize 9-11, it's throw away the book of laws. And anyway, let's go into this. It's uh, David Chandler, 9-11, The Hard Evidence. One of the hardest things uh, to do when we're talking about uh, the events of 9-11 is that it was such a huge, complex event. There's so many things happening. Everybody can see their anomalies. You know, things happened and you know that shouldn't have happened, this shouldn't have happened, and so forth. Why did the buildings come down? Why weren't the planes intercepted? How did the hijackers uh, manage to do what they did, and so forth? One of the problems uh, with trying to cover the whole waterfront in discussing 9-11 is that uh, how strongly we are certain of various elements, uh, it varies a lot. Like what happened at the Pentagon, what happened out in Pennsylvania where the plane went down, what happened at the World Trade Center. Um, I have come to believe that what we really need to do is to uh, focus on the elements of the um, events of 9-11 have been the most strongly analyzed and established so that we know what happened and we know that the official story is a fabrication at that stage. Okay. I've come up with, uh, I'd, I'd call it three plus one. There's three main points that I think uh, if you focus on these, I think you can establish really beyond doubt that 9-11 uh, had to have been orchestrated with insider complicity that goes uh, very broadly in the U.S. intelligence services and military-industrial complex, something like that. There had to have been connections at that kind of a level. But we don't start there. We're starting with hard, um, hard evidence. The first is the dynamics of the way the buildings came down. We have good uh, material about that. The second is the fires and the temperatures that were achieved in these fires. And the third is the fact that we've actually found uh, remnants of a material called nanothermite uh, in the dust. These, I think, are the strongest case that we have that something very sinister is going on in 9-11. It's not something that was uh, just a, uh, an outside uh, attack from Arabs or Afghans or anybody else who you want to think was involved here. I say three plus one. The other element is the cover-up. Probably as strong as any of the main lines of evidence is evidence of a cover-up. And when there's a cover-up, it's, in my mind, that strong evidence that there's something somebody wants covered up. And so I'd like to go back and focus on, in terms of what, are, what do we know on each of these grounds. I think it's important that we start at a very intuitive level, just looking at the event. Let's look at the North Tower, which was the, the one that 
uh, was the best photographed of the towers. At this point, the South Tower had already collapsed. Uh, the North Tower was the first one hit by a plane, but it was the second one to come down. All these cameras were looking at it, and we have um, a good uh, footage. Plus, it came down essentially um, straight down. There was a little bit of tipping, but it was essentially a straight down collapse. And what we see when the North Tower is coming down is along the edge of the building, you can see jets being uh, expelled very violently. Um, these are um, clearly explosions. The, the speed of the collapse, the, the breadth of the expansion of the debris, and um, the, the degree of pulverization are all indications that something very energetic is going on here. It's difficult to, to take concrete and reduce it to powder uh, because every time, if you think of it, if you break a rock, you had to create a new surface. And so it takes energy to pull that rock apart. And then you break it apart again. Each time it is subdivided smaller and smaller, it takes an additional input of energy. So to reduce this down to uh, micron-sized powder uh, takes a lot of energy. The dust cloud was not generated when the concrete hit the ground and fragmented and produced dust. This was dust before it ever hit the ground. There's very little concrete in the actual rubble pile. What we see in the rubble pile is steel, and the concrete has been spread all over Manhattan. I personally did uh, some analysis of, the, of the, the collapse of the North Tower during the time when the, the, the roof line was visible before it descended into the dust cloud. So this tower had perimeter columns around the outer walls. It also had a core structure around the elevator shafts and so forth with 47 very massive uh, core columns. The, the, there was a mast on top, it's a television antenna, on top of the North Tower. And at the very onset of collapse, the very first motion you can see is this descending. It wasn't down here where the break occurred. It wasn't as though the top section was starting to come down. What was happening was the top of the building was coming down before the, the break point, if that's what it was, uh, even began. So you see a crushing of the top section of the building. And the, the, the tower was directly supported over these core columns. So if you have 47 core columns and you take the, the roof line, which is coming straight down, that has to be that those core columns were basically eliminated. Uh, they had to have been removed suddenly and completely for the building to do that. The speed with which this came down, the technical term is the acceleration. It turns out that the, 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 the descent of the tower uh, was not at a constant speed. It was picking up speed as it went, and that's called acceleration. If you graph the descent of the North Tower, you can actually see that it accelerated all the way the entire time that the roof line is visible. Now that's very significant. For something to be accelerating downward, it means the net force acting on it is downward. Okay? Now there's two forces at work here. There's gravity and there's the resistance. And if the net force is downward, it means the resistance is less than gravity because the net force has to dominate downward. Therefore, it tells us that the resistive force was less than the weight of the block. But here you have this block continuing to pick up speed. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And the only way that can happen is to say, it is not crushing the bottom section of the building. The bottom section is being removed to allow this to fall into oblivion. This is falling into the, the, the hole, basically, that's been opened up for it. The rate of fall is not free fall. That's um, 
you might have heard that occasionally. A lot of people talk about how it's free fall or close to free fall. Yeah, it's two thirds of free fall if you actually measure it. It's falling at two thirds of the acceleration of gravity. So the North Tower, we have this situation where we can clearly show that the support has been removed, allowing this to fall in the manner that it's observed. There was a third building of the World Trade Center complex that suffered a total um, catastrophic collapse on the same day. It came down at 520 that evening, and it was across the street from the North Tower, and it's about half the height of the Twin Towers. It came down at absolute free fall for the first 100 feet or so of its collapse, all right? So uh, to have a building come down in absolute free fall means all resistance has been removed, okay? How do we know it's absolute free fall? We can measure it. The government agency that, um, that conducted the official investigation is called NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It used to be called the National Bureau of Standards. This is not really a forensic investigation, and they're not empowered to do a, a forensic investigation. This was a building safety investigation is what it was. And, but NIST came out with this report. In the draft report in August of 2008, uh, which was actually the final draft uh, apart from public comment, they presented uh, a report that claimed the Building 7 came down at 40% slower than free fall. The simplest observation of the motion shows that it's, it's very close to free fall. And if you do a detailed analysis of the motion, you can see that it's coming at absolute free fall. I had an opportunity to challenge NIST on this and other people as well. It wasn't me by myself, but there was a number of us who um, put in what was called a request for correction. And I was able to ask a question at their technical briefing. And what it comes down to is NIST fumbled the ball and they, uh, so they actually in their final report went back and changed the report to acknowledge free fall. So in the final NIST report, they literally acknowledged that the building was in free fall by their measurement, it was two and a quarter seconds. And uh, so this free fall has tremendous implications, and yet they simply waved their hands and said, it's consistent with our analysis. It's completely false. It's a completely bogus analysis, uh, uh, but that's the way it was. So what we see by the fact that NIST is trying to obscure the significance of this finding uh, is we see a government agency trying to whitewash uh, the situation here. I think the second uh, main point I want to make is that there were temperatures in the towers during this whole collapse event that uh, were far higher than could possibly have been achieved uh, by normal methods. In other words, if you take office furnishings, just a regular fire, and you throw in kerosene, and you say, how hot could this burn? Could that weaken the steel? Could that allow this building to collapse? At first, the storyline, the official story, was that the, the, because of the jet fuel, it was so hot that it melted the steel and so forth. Well, that didn't stand up very long. It was very quickly uh, shown that kerosene, which is essentially, jet fuel is essentially kerosene, this kerosene couldn't possibly get to a temperature where you would melt steel. The maximum temperature for uh, a hydrocarbon fire, that's basically ordinary organic materials, whether it's kerosene, hydrocarbons like that, or whether it's paper and things that you'd find in offices, the maximum temperature would be about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature it takes to melt steel is around 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. So in other words, it's, we're missing the temperature needed to melt the steel by 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is something that you can't just wave your hands. So the government story changed at this point. Um, rather than asserting that the, the steel melted, it was simply asserted that 
uh, it was weakened. Okay, so if you take the temperatures achievable in these fires, uh, all you have to get is around 1100 degrees Fahrenheit for it to weaken the steel uh, to half of its initial strength. Um, even so, and, and yes, you could get to those temperatures under ideal conditions, but even so, experiments uh, with actual physical structures show that if you take a steel frame structure, uh, it doesn't collapse. There's another side of the story as well. Uh, it's very clear that the temperatures needed to melt steel were actually achieved, okay? One of the main uh, pieces of evidence for this is that there is iron found in the dust. There are droplets of iron. These iron droplets, uh, the, the fact that they're droplets indicates it was melted in an environment where it was then sprayed. So it's like in an explosion. Uh, there's something that's hot enough to melt the iron and, and spray it around. Secondly, it does not have the chemical, com, um, chemical signature of structural steel. This is iron. It's from a different source. The most likely source for this iron is there is a, a kind of material used as an incendiary. It's not normally thought of as an explosive, uh, but it's uh, thermite. And thermite has, starts off with iron oxide and aluminum. And during the reaction, what you have is the oxygen jumps from the iron over to the aluminum. The aluminum is more attractive to the oxygen than the iron is. And when it, when it jumps, it liberates a lot of energy in the form of high temperature. And the iron comes out as molten iron. The aluminum comes out as aluminum oxide, which is like a white powdery substance. It's a smoke. And so what we see is white smoke and iron droplets. And uh, these droplets, if you take ordinary thermite in a lab, you can uh, react it, you'll get little iron spheres that result. What you see in the dust from the World Trade Center are iron spheres scattered all through the dust. In every sample of dust that's been taken, it's just absolutely jam-packed with these iron spheres. So right there, it's a signature that the temperatures needed, the 2,700 degree temperatures had to have been achieved uh, to make those iron spheres. So the fact that these iron spheres exist is a uh, very solid scientific proof that high temperatures were achieved. Uh, it goes beyond that. There's observations of iron or molten iron, molten steel, whichever, in the rubble pile. There's actual photographs of uh, either iron or steel pouring out of the South Tower just before it collapsed. Uh, so there's all of these uh, converging lines of evidence that these high temperatures were in fact achieved. There's a very good paper on this in the Journal of 9-11 Studies, and um, I encourage you, you can find that online and uh, look this paper up. One of the things that happened during the research uh, looking at these iron spheres in the dust, um, Stephen Jones is one of the central figures in this uh, investigation, uh, but he ran across lots of little red flakes in the dust. And these are brilliant red, and in fact they're red on one side and gray on the other, little chips. And these uh, would really catch your eye. Uh, but he spent um, over a year, I believe, actually investigating these, and other people were brought into this investigation. There was eventually a paper that was uh, published about this uh, in the Open Chemical Physics Journal, and it was on um, uh, evidence of um, thermitic materials in the World Trade Center dust. Um, let me describe this a little bit. Ordinary thermite uh, is something that burns very hot. Uh, I was telling you how iron melts at like 2,700 degrees. Uh, thermite, burning thermite is up around 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, way higher than needed for this, um, for melting of iron, okay? Um, ordinary thermite is not an explosive. It just is sort of like 
it was used it used to be used for welding uh, railroad tracks for instance and so it's like something that burns very hot um, however there are new technologies that use the thermitic reaction in different ways if you take the component particles that make up the thermite and you you make smaller particles it gives more surface uh, total surface available and the reaction goes faster and it can uh, actually get up to, to um, a reaction speed that approaches uh, what you would think of as a high explosive. This is not a, a traditional high explosive and by uh, tailoring the way this is manufactured you can take tiny tiny particles of this stuff and uh, you can tailor it to go faster or slower and if you add in um, hydrocarbons, which the idea of an explosive is you're going to have a material which has rapid expansion. So there's a pressure wave or a shock wave that comes out that uh, creates pressure that can uh, break things and so forth. All right. And so one thing is to get it hot. Secondly is to get it hot very quickly. And the third thing is to have something that expands and is able to um, uh, fracture things um, in the expansion to create an explosive. Um, this kind of thermite with these tiny particles is called nanothermite and in order to get these particles it's not a matter of taking iron oxide and breaking it down it's a matter of building up the components from the atom scale upward so in other words you use technology that you can fabricate it at the molecular level and you basically create nano sized particles these are like a hundred times smaller than a human red blood cell. So very, very tiny particles in very close association. And what we find in these red gray chips is in this red layer, you have the iron oxide and you have the aluminum and they are intermingled in very close proximity and it's into a medium which once heated can ex um, be vaporized and expand, so it can actually act like an explosive. So what we see is nanothermite has been demonstrated to be present in the dust. This paper is, it was an explosive paper, or should have been, in, a, in the symbolic sense of the word here. This should have been the, the coup de grace to this whole discussion, but it is uh, widely ignored they say, well, it wasn't one of the primary journals. Why was it in this little side-level journal here? The whole idea in science is you want to get your results published where other scientists can check what you've said, critique what you've said, and it's a process of openness and interchange of ideas so that uh, it can become self-correcting. The bottom line is, though, this paper has been published. The research has been done, and it has not been substantively um, critiqued. The validity of this, of course, is as, is as open to um, correction and critique as any other finding in science. But it's out there, and it's something that can't simply be brushed aside. By the way, the, st the steel, which would seem to be part of any forensic investigation, the site was cleaned up and the steel was cut up and melted down. Very few pieces were saved by NIST uh, and cataloged uh, for future study. We have uh, three very um, uh, clear, very solidly established pieces of scientific evidence. We have the dynamics of the building collapses, we have the high temperatures and the, the very strong evidence for these high temperatures and we have the presence in the dust of um, thermitic materials. The other uh, thing that's observable and is as clear as any of these is the existence of a cover-up. The Bush administration did not want to do an investigation of 9-11 at all. It took the family members of 9-11 um, uh, victims over a year to get uh, the 9-11 Commission uh, authorized. And so here was this rushed investigation. It was all political. The 9-11 Commission was governed by uh, a White House insider 
So even though it appeared to be balanced in terms of Democrats, Democrats and Republicans on the committee, it was the person managing the whole thing uh, that pulled it together uh, who was basically a spokesperson for the White House. They did a consensus, uh, they had a, a consensus policy. So anything where there was disagreement, they left it out. So any, anything in the whole 9-11 incident which uh, one side or the other of this argument uh, objected to, it was, it was not included. So we have the 9-11 Commission, which then produced a very hollow report, which did not grapple with um, uh, the facts of the matter. Then we had the NIST investigation. NIST is not a forensic investigation arm of the government. It's, uh, it's part of the Department of Commerce. And in the, if you read the beginning of the NIST report, it explicitly says how nothing uh, in a NIST investigation can be used um, to litigate anything with, against anybody. It was explicitly not looking for uh, perpetrators of any kind of a crime. It was a building safety investigation. They very intentionally sidestepped any dealing with anything that they might consider controversial in this. They limited the scope to the onset of collapse. They just blithely assumed as soon as you can account for where a collapse might, might begin, it was just assumed that it would continue and it would go all the way through. Um, in other words, they did not investigate the collapses. They looked at the planes, the crashes, they looked for weakening of steel, they looked a little of this, little of that, but they did not actually investigate what happens to a building as it's collapsing. Will it all go all the way down or will it collapse a few floors and stop, for instance? This wasn't covered. So the kinds of things that you actually see happening during the collapse are left totally without comment. We don't need to go through and answer every little question about the entire events of the day. We know right away that something is going on. It had to have had a very high level insider collaboration at the very least. So if Building 7 came down uh, in a demolition, and if that happened the same day as the towers coming down, all of this had to have been coordinated. I would call it an operation. I'll leave it at that and say there's something going on here that needs to be looked at, taken very seriously, and it can't just simply be brushed aside. Okay, well, another thing that can't be brushed aside is the fact that the roots of 9-11 go back so far, I mean, not actually as the 9-11 plot, but right after World War II, we systematically put the Nazis back in power in, in all the police states, uh, police agencies across Europe, you know, the, all the countries in Europe had been devastated by war. There were no police agencies there anymore. So everything was rebuilt using the Nazis that were available. And uh, the world competed to get them. It, it's amazing. And so it, it's, it's, no, it's no mystery why the CIA acts like a bunch of Nazis, because they were founded by Nazis. Um, and the Nazi philosophy is what has driven our country ever since. The foreign policy proves it, if you just look at the foreign policy. So, you know, here I am crusading for truth and justice, and, uh, you know, I think back to my youth. I lived in Israel for a while, and while I was there, I didn't know, I didn't understand, I wasn't political, but I was a member of the Israeli equivalent of the Nazi brown shirts, the, the Hitler Youth. That's what I was, an Israeli Hitler Youth. The organization was Hashomer Hatzair, the Young Watchman. Well, you know, my dad 
later told me what it was, and you know, I was having a good time. We were running around and you know playing war games as little kids. We didn't understand what we were doing. Well, then I just recently got to unpacking some of the stuff that my grandmother left when she died in 1985, and all that stuff got stored. And I finally got the privilege of unpacking it. And she had been superintendent of Chicago Public Schools for 45 years. Well, that was a magnificent achievement by itself. But she was highly active in, in the UN, and you know she wrote letters all the time, and I've got copies of almost everything she did. I don't know about that for sure. But somebody says, man, it sounds like she was on, you know, working for the CIA. I said, come on, get real. That New World Order crap, uh, you know. And, well, then I, in one of the packages, I found what on the internet is a $450 little necklace, a little tiny thing like this. It's the Order of the Eastern Star. Look it up. It's got an upside down pentagram and it's got all the symbolism and everything like that. It, it, you had to be a Freemason. And you had to be a very high level Freemason to get in as a woman. And I couldn't believe it. You know, she was a member of the, of, of the Illuminati. I mean, <laughs> I don't know for sure. If, but it just goes to show you, you know, I, I, I was kind of speechless by that. Well, we're going to go out and we don't, won't be able to see it all. But Israel, just like the Nazis that helped form them, uh, is now going to destroy 15,000 more Palestinian homes. They don't have any legal right to do it. They're just doing it because they can. And what are you going to do if, we, if you don't like it? So stand up and talk. Don't be afraid to speak out and don't take the crap anymore when they try to tell you a lie about what's happening. So see you next week. Israel is planning to demolish up to 17,000 Arab buildings in the West Bank. That's according to a UN report. Human rights groups are accusing Israeli authorities of forcing Palestinians off their land to allow expansion for Jewish settlements. RT's Paula Slea reports from Silwan, an area in Jerusalem, which has become a flashpoint in the standoff between Arabs and Jews. Just steps away from the old city of Jerusalem, a bitter war over land is playing out. The battleground, Silwan, a neighborhood where Arabs outnumber Jews 100 to 1. But Jewish activists with money are trying to change that and are buying up as many properties as they can. When they take a home, they close the area around the home. They have guards and police that use guns. They drive around with an armored vehicle. We don't interact with them. Fahi Abu Diab has lived here his whole life. He fears that by changing the numbers on the ground, Palestinian neighborhoods will eventually become Jewish, and those Arabs who don't want to leave will be driven out. Abu Naba Abdallah's family has lived in this.